Is that this will be everyone that signs in will start seeing us now. We already have five, so here they come. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mandy, we we're just talking about the uh, conditions so far. This uh, at this point in the late spring, and uh, it's another 90, 98 degree day here in St. Helena. Um, so we're about that. And we were over 100. We got up to 100 in the vineyard yesterday. But and it really doesn't seem to be having any negative impact that I can see on flower and, and set. And we're well into to berry set. So, mm -hmm. and uh, the crop looks uh, generous once again. And of course, the size of the crop is related to what happened a year ago. Right. Right, weather wise. So that sort of sets the stage. Those little tiny miniature microscopic clusters are already in place before we got this year going. Mm -hmm. So it always makes me stop and think. Um, <laughs> no, but it looks like a healthy crop and it's going to be an early one too. So, yeah, when are you, um, when are you thinking first harvest might, might be? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a guess, but we think uh, we could have Sauvignon Blanc by the second week of August. Whoa, that's really early. Is that the Vegas over under lot odds for this or? I know we have an internal, all of our staff always likes to guess when bud break is, when harvest is going to be well in advance, so. Yeah, we've got to get the bidding pool going. Yes. Um, no, but the reds are generally a September game, but it will look anyway. Yeah. Because we prune early and we, you know, we're not irrigating a lot. So a lot of things we do are really focused on getting harvest early. We want to come out early and then harvest early. How, what's harvest as, as it relates to the rest of the valley? Are you guys pretty, pretty early, pretty on target, pretty late? I mean, it sounds like you're on the earlier side. We're early as usual mm -hmm. relative to a lot of the valley. Yeah. Uh, our part and, of the valley. And we, uh, some of the vineyards right drive after, after, Pardon? Some of the vineyards dry farmed, right? Uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, that's a whole, I think that's a whole Zoom do we need another seminar for that? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we, 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 we are at 3.30, so people that are arriving, we are going to give ourselves about five minutes to have people log in. So just passing time on stage if you just joined us. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah. yeah, welcome everybody who's coming in. Appreciate you taking the time to be with Engelnook today. And uh, yeah, so... Should we talk a little bit about the history of uh, the estate, Mike? Sure, I was gonna give a couple more minutes to kind of run through. I was really interested, I didn't mean to interrupt you about your uh, thoughts about, you know, it's funny you talk about harvest, the impacts we received today versus last year's impact on today. It's really, for me, I don't think people understand that as much as I'd like them to. You know, you talk about what harvest and the growing conditions of the previous year and how they grow into the buds of this year. Yeah, well, the fact that we had a, a really great, uh, you know, a rainfall last year, well into the spring, and uh, really good weather last spring in 2019, set us, sets us up for a really good crop this year. So, yeah, the, everything is already in those buds before they open up this year, which is a, it's a real mind bender. Um, and then this year, uh, you know, we've had pretty skimpy. You know, depends on who you talk to and which rain gauge you rely on, but <laughs> half or 60% of a normal rainfall. So kind of in the 20, you know, 20 inches, anywhere from 15 to 20 inches, depending on who you talk to. So it's a low rainfall year, but we did get some, some nice little rainfall just over a week ago. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in good shape to handle little bits of heat like we're getting right now. Yeah, the vines aren't too stressed yet and everything looks yeah. pretty healthy out there. And actually the heat, as we go through the next few weeks, after we get through all, you know, through berry set, it's really nice to have some heat to throw, to slow down uh, the shoot growth. Cause you don't want active vegetative growth really while you're ripening your fruit. So once we get to Barasian, you know, we want everything, all those canes to be nice and woody and, uh, we want the energy of the plant to go into the fruit, not into growing leaves. Right, the thing that we're actually going to consume. Yes. yes. Well, you and me, maybe not like, you know, the animals and the critters in the, in the vineyard. No. 
<laughs> Although I, I, I assume they'd prefer the fruit anyway. Yeah, we have, uh, we now have some good fencing in place, but we've had some pretty lean years in the back edge of the property and some well-fed <laughs> deer. Good for those deer. Those are, that's some high quality fruit. They have I, a preference for, live the off white, the white grape for the rest of my life. And they prefer the white run varieties. As do many of us. Oh so, yeah. <laughs> There's been a lot of animal spottings as of late. I feel like I, uh, you know, you and I both live here in St. Helena, but I feel like I've been hearing a lot about like, you know, kite little coyote pups getting, uh, being found and some foxes and some bear spottings. And I always think that's so wild just living here. I, I moved from the city where, you know, we don't, the closest we're going to get is some sort of, uh, some sort of rat eating a pizza on the stoop. Uh, so moving here and hearing about bears like, you know, coming up and creeping up on people in their, in their driveways is kind of wild. Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons for, for the sightings. It's because, you know, people are, are outside more. Well, that's and true. Observing. And then also, you know, they're, they're in, now traffic's really picking up again. But, but for a couple months, it was very little traffic out there. So animals sort of could own the place. So I think between those two, yeah, there's been people have seen a lot of animals. Pretty cool. Yeah. Lots of snakes. Lot of snakes. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard. I'm glad I haven't seen any of those. Those are, uh, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure now that I've said that, want to like slither down during this. On that note, we'll go over the history of Inglenook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were yeah. kind of waiting for a couple people to arrive. It is about five after. So we do want to welcome everybody that's joined us for the webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Savage. I'm just going to be the moderator for the group. I'm going to direct your attention to hopefully the people you can see live shots uh, of Chris Phelps and Amanda McCrossan. Uh, they're going to be going through some wines from Inglenook, a very special trio set um, to go through, but I'll go more about who our speakers are. I'll start with Chris Phelps. Chris is a, an associate winemaker for Inglenook. He's been he with us since the early parts of 2017. It doesn't seem fair uh, to not round that in, but he's been with us for- 20, 2016, Mike. 2016? Why did I have 2017? It's okay, summer of 2016. 2016, I apologize. Okay, uh, I Chris it. was born of a wine-loving family. Uh, he likes to make new world wines with an old world sensibility, uh, blending experience and intuition with technology. <clears throat> Chris really is a great asset for us, uh, for Inglenook. Uh, he's had great experience working with uh, mentors, Christine Minot, excuse me, Jean-Claude Beru, is that right? Sorry, Chris. I have to apologize for my hey, lack Christian of- Christian <laughs> and Jean-Claude Barraway. Barraway, excuse me. I, I messed up on a couple of those. Uh, but a great, I'm going to call it legacy for the Napa Valley, working with Damas Estate in the early years for 12 years, uh, really has a great sense of what Inglenook is uh, for the property. So, did I miss anything, Chris? What's that? Did I cover all your high points? Yeah, that's good, Mike. Okay. I'll fill in the blanks, don't you worry. Yes. Yeah, man, if I mess up, please let me know. And <laughs> our invited guest is Amanda McCrossan. Uh, Amanda is a sommelier, media personality, wine educator, creator slash host of the Instagram and YouTube channel, Sambivant. Get that right? Yes, Sambivant. You got it. All right. Uh, she was a former wine director at Press Restaurant in Napa Valley. Uh, Amanda's worked with the largest, deepest restaurant collection of Napa Valley wines in the world. Uh, prior to that, uh, in 2018, Amanda's worked as a sommelier with the mentors. Uh, great accomplishments that I won't get into the names unless you want to bring them up, Amanda. Um, but again, focusing our efforts on, I'm going to go into this edutainment. Is that how you like to call it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> uh, and it's really working well again for some Vivant. So uh, an established speaker yeah. for us, great qualities, and we're very thankful that you can be with us today to try the wines. So oh, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you. And uh yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with Chris. I, I had the great fortune of working at Press Restaurant for about five years and worked with an amazing Napa Valley list, uh, very deep in Inglenook, uh, deep in Dominus, where of course Chris was. Um, and Chris and I have gotten to know each other over the years. So it's a real treat to be here with you today talking about this very historic estate. Um, Inglenook is, is one of the most historic wineries in, in Napa Valley and uh, certainly has given way to some pretty incredible sips that I've had over the course of my career. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of that estate. And I don't think there's a better person to do that than, than you right now, Chris. So well, you're up to bat. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and, and before we really get into this, I just, I want to, uh, just on behalf of 
not just the winemaking uh, vineyard team at Inglenook, but the entire hundred of us that, that they call Inglenook home, just we're, we're happy that everyone is, is uh, hopefully safe and your family's safe and, uh, and uh, that things will continue to get better and better and you'll come and see us soon. So that's uh, first and foremost, what we're thinking about is, is you. Um, so yeah, what's, what's interesting is, you know, I started out as a young winemaker in, uh, in the early 1980s in Napa Valley after coming back from uh, University of Bordeaux and an internship with uh, Christian Moex and the family that own, owns Petrus. And I, I cut my winemaking teeth at Dominus, which is, is it's, uh, it's centered at the Napa Nook Vineyard in Yonville. Now Napa Nook, a lot of people don't realize was part of Inglenook, you know, it's the, the, the nook in common. <laughs> but that little hundred acre piece in Yonville, when we arrived there uh, in, the, in the early 80s, there was a, a landing strip that John Daniel used to, to, used to use. And he, of course, was the owner of, of Inglenook for a long time. So- You say landing strip, like, a, like he'd land his plane there? Yes, he had a small airplane. Wow. He also had an air, airport in Rutherford, which most people don't know, but- did not we'll know. Talk You're about full of the best our, history. We'll talk about that on our aviation seminar next week. Yes, please. Um, but so I I was very conscious of of Inglenook and uh, its history. Uh, Christian's two original partners, Robin Lale and her sister Marky, were uh, the only children of John Daniel. So they grew up at Inglenook in the mansion that Francis and Eleanor Coppola raised their children in. So all this being said, and I, I had driven by, driven by Inglenook thousands of times, been on the property. And uh, so it was like coming back to Inglenook was like coming home for me um, in a way. And there's, yeah, like you said, Amanda, there's really no richer history, I don't think, in Napa Valley for an estate. And, and eight, so there's really several different eras. The Niebaum era started in 1879 when Gustav Niebaum, uh, a Finnish sea captain came and purchased the property, uh, wanted to uh, create something that, that you know, could make wines that would rival the, uh, the great wines of Bordeaux, or at least the left bank of Bordeaux. Yep. Ahead of his time. Yeah, and he planted Cabernet and other varieties he brought in and, and, uh, after he arrived. In 1881, he started building that iconic chateau, which is on our screen here. Uh, and 1882, first harvest of Inglenook, 1887, that chateau was completed. And then uh, he went on to make, you know, some amazing wines that really took the world by surprise. And uh, uh, he handed things off, uh, leaving the winery, the whole estate, which is, you know, 1,500 plus acres, uh, to his grandnephew, uh, John Daniel. And really, maybe the most remarkable era up to that point was the 1939 to roughly 1964 era of John Daniel. He made some very iconic wines uh, and really yeah, had- I, I have to interject there, Chris. I mean, those, those wines from that era are some of the best, if not the best wines I've tasted from that era when I was at press and, and just, just truly extraordinary. You can't believe how young and fresh and lively and nuanced they are. Have you had the 41, 1941? I have not had the 41, but... Of course, that's the one that got 100 points in the Wine Spectator. <laughs> going to make a lot of people upset in the audience. You're bringing these wines up that they can't taste, so... <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to get to the ones they can taste quickly. A virtual riot on your hands in a minute. Uh-oh. Yeah. No, those are remarkable wines. I've had the privilege of tasting some from the 50s, and they're, they're just... They're awesome. Amazing. Um, so he passed away in 1970, and, you know, unfortunately, the, the property uh, was divided up, and and went into corporate hands. Um, but not so long after, 1975, Francis and Eleanor Coppola came up from Southern California. And uh, so the part we see on the screen right now, the chateau and then the vineyard in front of that, they, they couldn't acquire, but the, the roughly, you know, well, let's round it off to 1,500 acres behind that, uh, which includes the best vineyard behind the, which is behind the chateau, the, uh, the captain's mansion, and then, oh, the mountain in the Mayakama is called Mount St. John behind Inglenook, that whole mountain. Um, 
they they acquired. So that's where they they had their children, and they still call it home today. And and then in 1978, Francis started making Rubicon, which is uh, has of course that's the flagship wine of England of today. Uh, and in 1995, was able to acquire the chateau and the front property, the whole what we see on on the screen now. And uh, basically having you know. And then in, I should say, 2011, he acquired the England name back. Right. So 36 years, untold amounts of money to put something back together again. And that, if that doesn't constitute someone with vision and, and, uh, and uh, I don't know, how would you describe it, Amanda? I mean, just like. I mean, I mean yeah, I mean, to piecemeal that, that level of property together and make it one again. I mean, it's a. It's an homage to the historic relevance and significance that is Inglenook. So, I mean, to put that much energy, time, and money into making that one complete parcel again and, and bringing it back home, I mean, that, that speaks volumes about, about the family and it speaks volumes about Inglenook, frankly. I don't, I don't, I can't think of any similar example in the Valley. I, I don't think there is one. Been, I mean, you know, not yet at least. You no, know, something that had fallen into corporate hands and then was taken out, you know, and rescued by a family, basically. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of funny. I was just reflecting earlier today that we don't really, you've been on the property, Amanda. I mean, it's, you feel something, don't you, when you come onto the property? For sure. And actually I was, I was just there right before, um, we were all sheltering in place. I think I'd been there not two weeks prior with, uh, the wine team at press. And I mean, there is just something about driving through and seeing that property. And then you, you get out of your car and it just kind of takes your breath away. I mean, there's just something very, very special. And even just walking through, feeling that history, you can feel literally generations that have come through that, that place and, and those, those vines. It's, it's really extraordinary. There's nowhere else like it in, in Napa Valley. Yeah, and what, what's, uh, what I was reflecting on today is, I, I, bear with me, is you know that, yeah, we, we grow these great, remarkable grapes and we, we do our best to make world-class wines and uh, and so on, but that's not really why we do it. Why we do it is exactly what you said, Amanda. It's to, it's to to show our respect for the property, this unique estate, and the vision of the Coppola family. So you know that's really the why of of the whole thing. Yeah. And then you know because I think virtually all of us on the property share this core value we we can come together and be innovative and be creative and and then we you know as a result we make these great wines so yeah. anyway I could well, go I, yeah I mean I think as we get into uh, to these wines and by the way we're gonna be tasting in an order that Chris determined which I think is interesting uh, it, itself but um, I think you know part of what makes Inglenook extraordinary especially in this era is the collaboration that's happening in the winemaking uh, on the winemaking side of things. So uh, you and, and, and everybody else that, that come together to make these extraordinary wines is, is also a, a very unique uh, facet of Inglenook. Yeah, and it is, you know, and I've, I've seen this through my whole career, the best, and it's not just wine, but the best things that happen in the world are the, are the product of collaboration and teamwork. And, and, and Inglenook is a very good example. I think, you know, I, I, I can I can take credit for some of the things that happened there, but but very little. It's <laughs> all about the team, yeah. and you know we're 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 still led by our director of winemaking, Philippe Bascol, who actually lives in, and works in Bordeaux most of the time, but he still has his uh, his heart and his mind on on England quite a bit. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, Jonathan Tyre, who's our who's uh, part of our winemaking team, Enrique Herrero who helps not just one run the winery, but also the vineyard and, and a whole, a whole staff, a whole team that, you know, works tirelessly to make the whole thing happen. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's a, uh, well, well, speaking of bringing some things together, we've got three wines that we're tasting today that have a, a, a link, a commonality that I think is really interesting that you, I think you said you, you suggested it or it was, sort of a collaboration of ideas, but uh, we're tasting a Cabernet Sauvignon, a Cabernet Franc, and a Sauvignon Blanc. So uh, I'll let you, Chris, the, the wine expert, tell us why, uh, why we're tasting these three wines and what they have well, in common. Since Inglenook, you know, is run by a family and we all feel like a big family there, 
it only made sense to have a family, a true family of wines. So, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon is actually the, the progeny of Cabernet Franc and, and Sauvignon Blanc. So, Cabernet Sauvignon. Right. So <laughs> Cabernet Sauvignon, correct. And, you know, it was, and it wasn't really until DNA could be used to track the origin of varieties, but, you know, um, and, and, uh, it was often suspected that Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon were, were very close to each other and related. But the, the, the fact that Sauvignon Blanc was a, basically a parent of Cabernet Sauvignon was not known. Right. So I think it's, just, it's just the coolest thing. Yeah, and, so, and I love that they're, they're coming in the trio as they are. Uh, oh, good, you're putting them back up there. Um, and then I, I think, you know, before we get into this, the other really cool special part about what we're doing today is the Cabernet Franc has not been bottled as a singular variety in, I think, almost a decade. Um, and, yeah. and just me personally, I one of the things that I noticed before I left press um, and, and I'm still noticing is sort of a resurgence of Cabernet Franc. So I definitely want to talk a little bit about what your feelings are on the grape as we get into that. But we're going to be starting with the Cabernet Sauvignon 2016. Um, so maybe we should, maybe we should drink a little wine, Chris. What do you think? Let's do that. <laughs> and I'll talk later about why we're tasting the white last. Oh yeah. I think that's a great idea. So uh, 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon, this is all estate fruit. And, and all of our wines are made from the estate and we're a large uh, organically farmed uh, vineyard. In fact, we were one of the first wineries to become uh, organically farmed uh, back in 1994. Oh, so, wow, that is really early. Yeah, and uh, didn't really talk about it for a long time, but it's been a long standing tradition. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I think um, when I hear some of the other wineries that have gone organic and have been organic for a long time, they, they say the same thing, that it wasn't really in fad. It wasn't the cool thing to do back in the 90s. Um, you know, it's sort of this, seen as this sort of like hipster, like, you know, maybe maybe a little too granola for- uh, for Not hipster, but kind of hippie. Hi well, hippie, yes. That is that is the, the yeah, word, word, yes. So we um, didn't really talk about it, but the coplas are, are, are part of their, the culture that they bring to us. Is, the, is this respect for the land. And so that's one of our primary directives. So 2016 is a vintage. Amanda, I'm sure you know, it's, you know, we'd had four years of drought. So yeah. when I think of the vintage 2016, I, and, I, and I taste this wine and its freshness, it's almost like you can imagine the vineyard and then the wines we made just, you know, this big sigh or this- A big like- <laughs> Yeah, this big, <laughs> yeah, taking a big breath and being so, uh, in balance, um, and it was a, a year of tremendous balance. Harvest, of course, it was my first harvest adding on it, but it was a, uh, it was so easy. I mean, just to make choices. The biggest choice we make is when to harvest. And mm -hmm. in 2016, it was just we picked everything exactly when we wanted to. Right. Hey, something really quick. Uh, those of you guys that are watching, please feel free to use the Q and A if you have questions directed about any of the wines. Um, specific questions let us know we'll go through that q a as we kind of go through and taste these wines but feel free to contribute i know we can't see you tasting but if you have comments feel free to comment if you have questions please use the q a that we can address so this this wine is a blend of, of the five red bordeaux varieties we have and has a nice seven percent cabernet franc in it um and we only have 10 acres of cabernet franc on the property so the fact that we managed to to make a Cabernet Franc uh, was, was meant we had a, you know, not a huge crop, but we had a, enough of a crop that we could carve some off because it's an excellent blending variety. Yeah, what do you think the Cabernet Franc is at? I mean, you obviously are present for the blending sessions. What is Cabernet Franc adding to, to this particular wine? Well, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll really see this when we get to the Cabernet Franc, the next wine, but for me, um, and I hope some of you are tasting these wines at home, uh, you can get this three pack later and do it, do it with your with your family, um, your friends. But uh, for me, it's it's a lot about aromatics, and and with Cabernet Franc, they can be good or bad. Right. So if you have a bad clone of Cabernet Franc or is planted in the wrong place, you can get extremely, uh, you know, green, very very vegetative characters. But that's not the case in Inglenook. It, I didn't look at ads. I think it's sort of a, uh, a red, for me, a red rose, at least the ones I have growing in front of my house, but, uh, but a red rose, um, 
a sort of a, there's a there's a black tea character I get a lot. I always kind of likened it to um, like a like a miraplaz. So when you start a sauce or, or anything like that, it's sort of that like those aromatics. They they add a little bit of nuance, but they don't add a whole lot. It just kind of gives gives offers like a nice little cradle. Um, no, the savory, is, that savory component you'll see for sure in the Cabernet Franc. Yeah, and if you think about Cabernet Franc from somewhere like the Loire Valley, which doesn't get quite the ripeness that we get here in Napa Valley, you see that in spades, right? You get that really big green bell pepper. It's it's a totally different beast than what we've got here in Napa Valley. So I've always I, I've always found Cabernet Franc a very interest to be an interesting grape for that reason because you can have very different expressions of of uh, the same grape in two different terroirs and, and climates. Um, we, uh, Anna Marie, I see that you're, you're drinking this wine and I, I appreciate you following suit. Um, we will answer the question about why this order, Chris, I promise you has a, has a great explanation for it. And one that I, I happen to agree with, but. If we tell her now, she's going to sign off, so. What's that? If we tell the answer now, we, she's going to sign off. I know we, we've got, well, she's we got the wine, so maybe not, but, um, but I, you know, I love this wine. I love that you, you guys are doing a blend. Has this wine always been a blend or, or was that something you, you moved to? And, uh, of course, in this, this used to be called cask, this bottling. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Now it's called Cabernet Sauvignon because we really, it, it really was not tied at all to a cask hmm. uh, concept. So it just seemed in, in disingenuous to continue to refer to it that way. And uh, yeah, ironically, it's labeled Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's, it's, it's always been a blend. Yeah. So it, I know we don't, be, we don't, sorry, I don't, we don't have it in front of us, but can you talk a little bit about the difference between this and something like Rubicon? Well, so Rubicon is the top echelon. Uh, it's the top wine we make. And um, in 2013, that was actually 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. So it does get kind of confusing, but... Rubicon is the best wine it can be, and a Cabernet Sauvignon is the best wine it can be. Yes, Rubicon takes precedence, and there are certain blocks that year in and year out many times make the Rubicon blend. Mm -hmm. um, and Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon is our second wine. So it comes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the very best it can possibly be, but it is our second wine. Yeah. And if I can um, jump in too, Chris, one of the things that's, you mentioned John Daniel Jr., uh, the legacy of this estate and the wines that come from the property, making the wine as Cabernet Sauvignon with John Daniel's legacy label is one of the things I think the Coppola's are very yeah. proud of, being together and connecting those elements. It's not to downgrade one or the other, but when we go into this beauty and the property, uh, it's a phenomenal way to kind of bring the heritage back to the public. No, thank you, Mike. And that was that was one. I wasn't there at the time, but it was one big reason for for bringing uh, for taking cask off and making it just stand by itself with the old label. I love the old label. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, just I just so think this, I think this is like so supremely balanced. I can just sense that that growing year, that that harvest, and there's a luxuriousness. Um, I think the the tannins are super fine grain. Yes, almost talky. And it's just, uh, but and it reminds talc me. Talky? Yeah. I don't, just I don't, like talc. a chocolate, okay. Oh, like talc, okay. Yeah, powder. Talking about it, okay. Yeah, like for sure. They're, they're so, you know, when you rub a talc on your fingers, it just has a very fine, smooth. So there's Thanks. a, it's a polished, um, you know, uh, it's soft, but it don't be fooled. This is a wine that is going to age a long time. Yeah. Uh, you can feel that, you can feel the power in it, but it's, it's, uh, I think it's going to age at least as well as the 2013, which is a remarkable one. Oh, for sure. I mean, the 2016s, what we were tasting across the board were extraordinary, but a wine of this caliber is certainly going to be going for hopefully as long as the 1941 has, um, although I haven't tasted it. But, uh, uh, you know, I think this wine is really special and unique in that it, it it's sort of a hybrid of all the, all the sensibilities that we love about old world wines, but with this sort of California ripeness. And it's, it's not overdone. It's just a, a perfect level of sun-kissed fruit, a little pop of, of ripeness and sweetness, um, but really just a balance and a restraint to kind of pull it back. It's a, it's a gorgeous and fresh. wine. And fresh. Yeah, fresh. Really fresh. I mean, and a, a mouthful that, that doesn't doesn't feel cloying, doesn't feel weighty, doesn't feel like you're going to be uh, not wanting another sip of this after three, um, you know, wine that you can enjoy a full bottle of and not feel overwhelmed by it. No, we, we feel very strong, and this ties into my own personal belief too, that, you know, wine is a beverage, it's meant to be enjoyed, um, 
And we, by all means, um, I mean, Mike read it in my little bio, but I really believe that when we make the best one we can in Napa, <clears throat> excuse me, in Napa, we're, we're yeah, we're, we're, we're not denying its Napa identity. We're not trying to make a Bordeaux wine, but we want it to have the nuance and the elegance and the charm of Bordeaux, but with a, with a big nod to what Napa is, and that means more ripeness, more generosity. So I think it is entirely possible, and I think the red wines of Ingelnook epitomize this, this being right on that, on that edge. You know? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's on the edge. I think it's just perfect, right? Like I think you've you had the you have the ability to harvest exactly when this wine uh, wanted to be harvested or the grapes wanted to be harvested, and I think it shows in the glass. It's just you pluck the berry exactly when it wanted to come off the vine and not a second early and not a second too late. Um, and it shows, I mean, it's just a very complete wine. It's a balanced wine. We, we use the word balance a lot and I think it's probably an overused word to some extent, but I think, I think it's the perfect word for this wine because it just, you know, it hits your palate, it, it fills it, it rounds it out. And then all of a sudden it's gone and you're back to another sip again, unless you've got a bite of meat, of course, in between. Yeah, I'm not going to argue. <laughs> We might go on to the Cabernet Franc. I think so. Well, I think everyone's dying for the. I I know I'm dying for the Cabernet Franc. You know, um, I would be happy just to stay on the Cabernet. But. I know, I know. But we're going to do the Cabernet Franc, and we're moving to a different vintage and a vintage. I think some will have questions about. Um, it's certainly something that I hear. I get questions about almost daily. Uh, the 2017 vintage in Napa Valley. Um, so Cabernet Franc, uh, as you mentioned, only 10 acres of this planted on property, uh, which results in a teeny tiny amount of wine. And uh, if anyone didn't catch this earlier, this is the first time in almost a decade that you guys have bottled this as a single variety. Um, you know, for me, Cabernet Franc has been a variety I've been really excited about. It was a, a, a tiny little sector on our list at press for a minute. And then I think by the time I left there, it was like a full page, if not more than that. Uh, so it's clear that Cabernet Franc has, has had some sort of resurgence in the past decade or so. And one that I'm excited to see more of. So I'm, I'm particularly excited about this one. Um, so t tell me about this wine. Well, it was, uh, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't plan to make it, to be honest, but we, we completed our, our blend of Rubicon and we were in the middle of blending the Cabernet Sauvignon and we saw that we had basically more Cabernet Franc than we really needed. Mm. So we broke off a really sweet, a lot of Cabernet Franc. It's it's from our little bridge bridge block, which you know, not surprisingly, is located near the bridge on the property. I like when something's aptly named. Yeah, and um, so it's a um, it's just I think it has it has kind of a a crushed red currant and uh, and black cherry, the rose petals I talked about before. Yes. Kind of, and, and it's like this, that aromatically for me, it's just so, so enticing and so compelling. Yeah. I think aromatically, this is for, for sommeliers and wine professionals that have to study wines and their general characteristics. You know, when we do blind tastings, there are certain things about certain varieties that uh, are, that are flagships, right? Um, are hallmarks of the wine. And rose petal is one of them. I mean, if you're getting like a pink or red rose petal, uh, you know, a little bit of herbaceousness, um, you know, a, a little bit of a, a savory character. It's going to be, Cab it's likely going to be Cabernet Franc. And what I've loved about Cabernet Franc, especially from Napa Valley, is you get all of those and they're really kind of combined. And it, it almost smells like you've got a fresh bouquet of flowers coming at your face. And then it's very silken. It's, you know, it doesn't, it never feels heavy. It always feels a little bit on the lighter side of things. And uh, I think the addition of Cabernet Sauvignon has really leveled this up a little bit to um, to give us a little bit more body and texture than we're used to with just a straight Cabernet Franc. And I think I think it's really, you know, your mention of, of a savory quality uh, a couple of times. I think that really comes out on the palate. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's a, I think it's a little bit of like fennel, just a little bit of fennel or something. Too. Yes. And yeah. as, I'm not, no, I'm not sure, but a little, something a little bit green of a green plant, but that just yeah. makes it all the more intriguing. You know. Yeah, I think I think the fennel call is great. I you know I love some of those. Um, what's the uh, the vegetable I'm thinking of? Um, 
anyway, uh, maybe, it's, well, yeah, it's fennel. Um, but it, I like that it's more fennel and less anise. It's got more of the green savory tones versus anise, which can go a little bit dark and almost bitter. This, this is really lively, um, but it's subtle. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hit you in the face and it doesn't hit you in the palate. It's, it's really, again, it's really, really well balanced. Yeah. How, how different is this to farm uh, and make versus something like a Cabernet Sauvignon? Is it similar treatment? No, I don't think there's a real distinction in how we farm it, but um, we have to be, I think it's, I mean, harvesting, deciding when to harvest every variety is crucial, but Cabernet Franc somehow takes a little more time. I think it's, I've seen this because we had, we have had, I've had Cabernet Franc following me throughout my career. And it, if you, if you pick it at the wrong time, it, it just doesn't work. If you pick it too early, and then it, if you pick it too late, it, it really sort of um, becomes kind of soupy or something, mm. and it flabby. Um, so it's because it, the pH can be quite high. It doesn't have as much acidity as Cabernet. So other than sort of the, the harvest aspect, I wouldn't say we really farm it differently. Mm. Um, how do you find this to be uh, versus the Cabernet? I mean, the, the addition of Cabernet Sauvignon, is it, is it bringing a little bit more body to the equation? Definitely. I think we, we thought, you know, it was almost sort of too naked, too... Um, oh, yeah. scandalous. <laughs> but too, you know, too, uh, it needed some... Um, it was so aromatic. It was so mm. exuberant. It just needed a little bit of, you know, uh, clothing. Yeah, I don't know how else to get around <laughs> that, but, but a little more something to kind of light up, like hold it down. Yeah. It's yeah. A, well, it feels anchored. I mean, it feels like a wine that wants to, it, and it is jumping out of the glass, but it feels like a wine that like wants to pounce at you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does feel like something is there to anchor it back a little bit. I would, I would compare it if you had the raviola at, at Bottega restaurant. I, I have not had the ravioli. Oh, they are to die for. They have ricotta in them. They're the, they're the lightest. And so I, I usually joke, and I probably wasn't my idea, but uh, might have been the chef's idea, but um, Chef Michael's. But if you don't put some nice uh, tomato sauce on the ravioli, they just float away. They're so light. <laughs> so it's kind of like that. It's kind of like anchoring. It is, it is it's sort of, it sort of centers the line and calms it. Okay, it's going to be okay. Um, but, but it needed, we, we, did, we resisted at first, but it, it made the wine so much better if you'd been there at the blending. Yeah. And then 17, of course, was a challenging vintage. Um, we, had, we had several periods of heat. Mm. So right. it, was, it was kind of a question about how we managed to, to work with the heat. Right. You know, we were able to apply a little bit of irrigation before those heat spells. That helped. We also untucked some of the, the, the shoots so that they would protect the fruit a little bit more. Definitely didn't strip away the leaves from the fruiting zone. So we protected the fruit in any, every way we could. And I think that's one reason this is so good. Yeah, I think if we could touch on this, the 2017 vintage as a whole, just for a moment, I think this is a vintage that uh, you know we're, we're starting to obviously see a lot more 17s come out. Um, and one of the big questions is, of course, related to the fires that happened in Napa Valley. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is, is how hot that vintage was uh, and the heat spikes that we got in late July and August. I mean, to the point where, like, you know, most of Napa Valley was jetting out to the city because it was just unbearable here. Um, but can you speak to the vintage as a whole and, and how it relates to the fire and, and, you know, when this was harvested? Yeah, we have to mention the word fire. Inglenook was was very, very fortunate, but I've been talking a bit today about how early we harvest. Mm -hmm. and, and one reason is because we want freshness. We want, you know, a moderate alcohol, not a lot of alcohol. We want the wine to be balanced. So that's kind of our whole thing uh, when it comes to winemaking. And so we were picked, you know, almost a week before the fire started. So we were we were still fermenting, but we were locked up and sealed in the winery, so there was no problem. Right. Um, and actually, ninety percent of Cabernet and Napa Valley was had been picked, so right. you know, the valley was. It's not as dire as a lot of people would have you think. 
But clearly, people because of the fire, people tend to forget all about the heat. <laughs> it was hot. I was actually, and I want to say it was in early September when we had the hottest one. Because it was, it I might, forget. It might have been. Because it was 115. Yes. At a spot, again, right against the Mayakamas, and I was filming with the BBC. <laughs> and, and it's a pretty sweaty take, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I remember quite vividly. But I think we did a lot of work with in the vineyard with shade cloth and and uh, just protecting the fruit any way we could. And yeah. I think that the results are in the wine. Yeah. No. I mean, there there is there is a really beautiful ripeness to this wine. It does not feel over the top. And I think you know, seventeen is a vintage that's characterized by heat, not by fire. Um, and you know, for you to achieve this perfect level of ripeness in a vintage like 17 is is really a testament to your skills in the vineyard and your skills in, in the winery as well. It's just a really beautiful balanced wine and most of the 17s that I'm seeing right now are just a little bit too over the top, a little a little more than maybe we want to uh, to, to experience in a glass. So I mean a yeah. beautiful Cabernet Franc. What do you think of Cabernet Franc as a grape? Do you think we're, we're having some sort of resurgence? Is this going to oh, be? Oh absolutely. I think people are ready for something different and I, I I don't know if this will be, it's not something we're promising to do every year. We do, uh, you know, kind of spoiler alert, we do have a 2018 we did. So um, we don't know if we'll be able to do this every year. We would have to plant more Cabernet Franc because frankly, if we need it for Rubicon or Cabernet Sauvignon, it, it won't be available. Mm -hmm. And it's only a few hundred cases and, you know, Buy it while you can. That's all I can say. <laughs> I uh, have to jump in to say part of the employees. There was a huge petition of employees to get the Cabernet Sauvignon, or sorry, Cabernet Franc, back as a single varietal uh, because there was such a great following of the wine. Uh, there was always the integrity of the wines made from the estate to represent the estate, not to try to make something else. Uh, and I can tell you, I'm extremely happy that. Cabernet Franc, at least this 2017, and we'll cross our fingers that 2017, 2018 uh, will be out there for people to purchase and enjoy. Yeah. Thank well, you. I think I think we've uh, we've kept people waiting just about long enough uh, to maybe reveal why it is we've tasted in this order as we move to the Sauvignon Blanc. Well, it might not be so exciting after. <laughs> you, know. you have to you have to build it up a little. Well, I just. You know, this is something I started a uh, habit I picked up in Bordeaux and and I've I've always tasted tend to taste it tend to taste uh, whites after reds with my friends and at home uh, because and particularly in the case of a variety like Sauvignon Blanc, the, the pH is very low relative to red to red wine. So that there's a lot of acid. I mean, it's 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 this and this is no exception. This Sauvignon Blanc is very fresh. Uh, it's got a lot of citrus notes, um, and it's actually the perfect wine for a hot day like today, I got to yeah. say. And so you have all these acid receptors on your tongue, and if you have this before, and you just buzz all those receptors out before you get to your reds, you're not going to have the same. You'll be able to appreciate them, but I don't, my personal opinion is, and, and for me personally, it's, I mean, everyone has their own way to do things. It really, it really lets me experience those reds full throttle and it does not diminish my enjoyment of the white afterwards. No, I think if anything, it, it actually uh, increases or enhances it. You know, to me, as you, you're, the explanation of acid is spot on, right? So you, your palate is always trying to achieve some level of neutrality. So when you, put something in your mouth, be it water or wine, it's always, you're gonna salivate enough to bring that to some level of neutral, but you've sort of established a base coat so that if you start with a white wine and that acid is low, is the acid's higher, peach is lower, uh, you're est essentially establishing a base coat of your mouth being at a higher level of, of threshold for acidity. So that when you put a lower acid wine later, it's gonna feel a little bit flabby. So I'm with you, I think doing this after, these red wines, which are a little bit softer, they feel um, uh, rounder in the mouth, the acidity is a little bit lower, putting this after actually heightens it a little bit and makes for a more pleasurable experience. You know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of like when the winemakers come in during harvest and uh, all they want is a bottle of champagne, like they're just craving acid. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, there's some, there's, it's true. This is extraordinarily aromatic. I mean, 
you know, you stick your nose in this glass and it just yeah. jumps up at you. And, and I, what, what's, is it Sauvignon Blanc? Is it Semillon? Is it, what, what's coming out of here? I, it's a Sauvignon Blanc. I think this, this, the, the Semillon is not, is not really contributing a lot to the aromatics here, even though it's 11%. Um, and it's only the second year we've used Semillon in our blend. Um, I think it was 12% in the 2017. Mm. But it's, it's, uh, it's a lot, ever since I, I experienced gooseberries, it was actually in Ireland, it reminds me of gooseberries. Have you ever had a gooseberry? You've actually had a gooseberry? Yeah. You can, <laughs> you can buy them canned here. Oh, okay. And if you haven't had them, you should try them because for me, it, this is like a great expression of gooseberry. And it's, it's uh, so there's a little bit of a savory note. Oh, big surprise. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's in the family of Cabernet Franc, right? Right. <laughs> but there's a little bit of a green note, often in, in, in Sauvignon Blanc. Right. And I, and, I, um, and I think, you know, we don't, at Inglook, we don't like, we don't, you know, we don't go for the, the big green uh, thing. We, we pick a little later, but we don't pick so late that we get tropical flavors. No, there's, there's no tropical here. And I think, you know, another, another important distinction as we're tasting this and we're talking about acid, I think some people are like, oh, I don't know if I like so much acidity. I don't, it, this is a stealthy wine, right? This is a Sauvignon Blanc that it's kind of like a, like a, this is maybe a bad example for some, but you know, when you've got a Riesling that's got a little bit of, of sweetness to it, but it's got massively high acidity, but you can't really feel it. This, the roundness and the texture of this wine is sort of masking some of that acidity. So you know it's there and wow. it's giving great structure, but there is, and I'm seeing that there's eight months of aging Sir Lee uh, and, and a little bit of uh, French oak as well. I wonder how much of that is, is allowing the acid to really just wow. be a little bit tempered by that. I think, I think you was well, spot on. Are you sure you're not a winemaker? No, I don't make any wine. I just drink it. I'm very good at that okay. part. But I think that, yeah, the, all that lee stirring and, uh, you know, Jonathan at the winery is remind, reminding me today, you know, we stir three times a week at first, then wow. down to two, then by the, by the end of the year, we're stirring once a week. But that's a lot of stirring. Mm -hmm. So all that yeast autolysis is contributing all these wonderful things to the, the body of the wine. And it does really seem, and I don't think of it often, but Amanda, you're, I think you're exactly right that it, it not that we're, we're not trying to hide the acidity, we're trying to balance the wine. Right. And so, we'll, you know, maybe it's not even conscious, but I think it's in there, but yeah, you're not, you're not getting hit over the head with it. I think it's- No, it doesn't. I think some people feel like they're going to be tasting like a, like a warhead or, you know, something really, really acidic. And there is acid here and, and you can feel it and your, your gleekers kind of go, right? You're salivating, but there is something there to temper it and kind of bring it back to neutral a little bit faster. It doesn't make it feel so harsh. Uh, mm -hmm. And acidity can be very harsh just on its own. So sort of that texture makes it a little bit more tolerable. And quick question from uh, the audience was, uh, can you kind of go into what Sir Lee is as a practice? And then my own question is, can you talk about the oak integration? Yeah, so it just, um, as far as turning on the lees, so Sir Lee means on the lees um, in, in French. And it just, as, it's, as long as the lees are clean and aren't, aren't uh, because sometimes the lees can have, uh, can get a bit, frankly, a little bit stinky. And Chris, uh, lees is yeast cells, correct? The lees are all of the solids from, from fermentation that just fall to the bottom of, in this case, the barrel. So it's just all, it's not just, it's dead yeast. It's, um, it's all of the fatty acids, all of the, you know, the, the, there's a whole plethora of chemical compounds that go along with it. And there's a lot of solids too, okay? It's not just, you know, it's, it's a solid mass and it's sort of a, a um, it's a milky to brown in color and it can be quite thick. And, but it's been discovered that by stirring these up and getting them into solution uh, once, two, three times a week, you really encourage, uh, you know, and there's a whole process that can be ex explained chemically about how it built, it literally builds the body of the wine. Had we not stirred the lees, if we just wrapped it clean, it would not have nearly this much body. Right. So, I always think of it like a, like a sauce or like a bechamel, like as you're incorporating that flour, like it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 
it's just a gentle integration of it and it doesn't necessarily want to they don't want to bond but they kind of do um so if you think yeah, of, but, but that those yeasty the, those these leaves are sort of if you think about like uh yeast so you think about bread or croissants or like any sort of baked product and what that smells or even tastes like uh you're you're essentially kind of weaving that into the wine uh and, it, and i'm this is a very very elementary ex explanation compared to chris's but that's the way that my brain sort of thinks about it yeah and instead of getting you know butter and flour in there you're right. getting you're getting polysaccharides and and these great constituents which was just all kind of glom onto each other and make the wine what it is so yeah, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying this wine today. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pose a question to you. Go ahead, Chris. 2018, so it's coming up on two years old. Yeah. And it's as fresh as it was when it was bottled, so. Yeah, I, and I think um, Sauvignon Blanc doesn't get the credit it deserves for being an ageable wine, especially when it's made like this, and it, it's got, you know, lift and body and acid, and I, I think this wine is going to be just lovely in five, ten years. Um mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if most people know this, but Chris is an incredibly, uh, in addition to being an incredibly accomplished winemaker, is an incredibly accomplished pizza maker. Uh, so my question to you, Chris, is which pizza goes with which wine in this lineup? Oh, Porcini pizza goes with all of them. Porc <laughs> okay. Is that a white but, pizza? No, but I would, I would probably do, I do a white pizza Porcini. I love Porcini. Hmm. But white pizza, you know, so no tomato sauce for the Sauvignon Blanc, and this adds a tomato sauce. But Fontina mozzarella, fresh mozzarella. Yeah, yeah. a white now pizza for the Sauvignon Blanc, red sauce for the uh, yeah. for the two reds. Now I'm hungry. So uh, Mike had a question about oak, and let's see. I, I just have to look here. We used nine percent new French oak. Um, we're very. We only add the oak because we want to just add a little top note, a little bit more complexity. We don't want you to sense, um, I mean, Amanda, do you pick up any French oak in there at all? Because- I, No, and I, I think that's important because you're not getting any sort of the traditional baking spices, the vanilla, the cardamom, the clove. Uh, you're not getting that either aromatically or on the palate. You're just getting a sense of texture. And, and complexity and- Yes. I think it just, it, you know, anything we can do to enhance the, the complexity and the elegance of the wine. And we really, and we did trials before we ever added any. I mean, I think a couple of years before we were playing with it. So now we're, we just add a small amount. We're comfortable with adding a small amount of new oak. Yeah, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm drinking this at a fairly room temperature right now. Um, so, which unfortunately is about 70 degrees right now. Um, but I have to tell you, you know, I think, the quality of this wine is really spotlighted when you drink it at this temperature because it's it's incredibly enjoyable even at room temp, uh, which is the signal of a great white wine or great wine in general. So don't feel like you need to ice this wine down and get it super, super chilly. It's a really, really well-made white wine that could be could potentially be at about 65 degrees if you want it to be your 60 degrees. No, good observation, thank you. Yeah. And if I can too, I think it's really great that, you know, the wine, the oaking doesn't define the wine. It really helps complement the body of it and accentuate the features that I think our team does a great job of highlighting. And as I kind of have this new slide up, uh, that trio pack all together, um, I think our team did a really good job of making subtleties connecting all these three wines. Their connection makes one picture of the chateau with the red roof, the chateau, the blue sky, and the green trees. Uh, they all come to represent the estate, which I think is a great overall package, which having it as this trio uh, really is a special representation to the property. It is available online. Uh, the Cab Franc is the elusive, I call it wine in that thing that we don't have that sold individually, whereas the other two wines are uh, available. And I know that some of our members are already asking when they'll be able to do it. Uh, I can't tell you when, but it is one of those thoughts that uh, members, because we don't make enough of this wine, it won't make distribution and won't make our shipments, uh, might be available for us to be purchased directly on an allocation basis, because again, we don't have that many of it. You're teasing me with that gift shop, Mike. It's my favorite gift shop in the Valley. We would love to invite people back in here, and it seems that uh, that is soon around the corner of being able to lease the shop. Uh, it seems like those provisions are happening. Uh, we are making all the plans we can to go into full tastings, uh, to have people come through. We are waiting for it to be safe to invite guests to make sure that 
all of those uh, aspects are, uh, dare I say, ready, and the people can can taste in a comfortable environment and really represent the estate. Hey, Mike, someone's asking about the cost of the three pack. Do you want to address that on live or? I uh, need to take a quick look because I unfortunately went through um, and got the wrong slideshow up to share everybody, so I'm gonna stop that one. Um, why am I blinking on this? I'm gonna just phone a friend on that. Can you uh, do a quick soft show and then get that answer for you? <laughs> oh, yeah, also there's a question about Edizione Panino or Zinfandel, which someone is enjoying right now, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Anonymous, but uh, they, they used to love the Director's Reserve Zinfandel. We will not bring that back at any look. Uh, if anything, we'll be reducing. We, we, we make just a few wines. We try to do them very, very well. Francis Ford Coppola Winery, our sister winery, may be making that, but I'm not positive. I'd have to, I'd, I don't know off, offhand. One thing I was going to tease about that Zinfandel is uh, we make Primitivo on the property. We represent it on the estate. Um, I can't say anything, but there are plans on making a Dizioni Panino Primitivo in the near future. So it's again one of those things that things we can't reveal, but we have the wheels working in the background, and that's why I left that question up for you guys. Great. Well, clearly a lot happening at Inglenook uh, these days, so it's been a treat to taste everything, and what a what a fun trio pack to do it with, um, and of course, great company to to do it with as well. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Amanda. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been, sure. it's been fun. I'm excited to drink uh, this Sauvignon Blanc a little bit colder because it is quite warm. Um, and I look forward to being back at your, your uh, place for pizza. And I look back, look forward to being back at Inglenook um, to see what's going on there. You guys just yeah. do such a great job. Well, with the party. I would like to say before we sign off too, that for all of those of you who, who would like to come back to Inglenook, um, we, we, we can't wait to welcome you back. And if you've ever been to England, like you already know that, uh, to brag a little bit, but our staff uh, at the Chateau is, is uh, supreme at, at hospitality and service. And uh, even as an employee, when I walk in there, um, it's not because I'm on the winemaking team. Um, I'm treated like, uh, I don't like I'm somebody special. Everybody feels that way. So as we, as we, you know, whenever the, the, the day comes when we can come back in and welcome, come back, welcome you back, um, just understand that that service will be ratcheted up to whatever degree is necessary to um, assure your safety and your comfort, so. And I uh, got the phone in from the friends. The trio pack uh, is sold as a trio in three in that wood box. It's $200 for the set. Okay, excellent. Oh, good. My mom's here. She said she's coming back when she comes to visit me again. Okay. Hi, mom. <laughs> you can bring her to next time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, thank you so much, everybody. This has been a lot of fun. A uh, very delicious time for me and hopefully a delicious time for those of you who are drinking and will be a delicious time if you order the trio pack and, uh, and do this all again. Okay. And let's do it again with some other wines next time. I would love that. Thank you. All right, Amanda. Stay well. Bye. And okay. as we close out, thank you guys. Feel free to visit us online. That's our sales part we have of www.inglenook.com. Uh, again, the sales are there too. We uh, are working at a certain point. If we don't have in live tastings, the idea of virtual tastings are coming through as best we can. So, with that, thank you, Amanda, for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you again, Chris. Uh, it's such an amazing perspective for the technology for us to witness. So, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.